Hi, Russ of Aquarimax here. Are velvet ants the best invertebrate pets? Well, today, after a brief introduction to velvet ants, we'll talk about housing and care, and then go into the pros and cons of keeping velvet ants as pets so that you can come to your own conclusions. First of all, velvet ants are not ants at all. They're actually wingless wasps. Well, at least the females are, and those are the ones that we keep as pets. They're called velvet ants because of this lovely fuzzy exoskeleton that most of them have and that's part of the attraction of keeping them as pets. They're very widespread. There are about 8,000 species found nearly worldwide and they tend to appear in places with sandy or hard packed soils. The adults are nectar feeders and the larvae feed on the larvae of other insects. They're actually parasites on things like ground nesting wasps and bees. So there's a brief introduction to velvet ants. Now let's talk about care and housing. The vivarium in which you keep the velvet ants needs to have good ventilation. I like to use a glass vivarium like this. I'll put links in the description to this particular vivarium. This one has a steel screen mesh, which works really well. Velvet ants can climb smooth surfaces, so they need something that's tight fitting, but they also need a lot of airflow to keep the low humidity that they are used to. Lighting is pretty important too. The light provides a little bit of warmth and it also provides illumination for you to see the velvet ants, but also so the velvet ants remain active. I'll put a link in the description to this particular uh, light fixture that I'm using and a variety of light fixtures can work. It's important to make sure that you don't provide too much heat. So if you use a basking light for reptiles, for example, keep the wattage fairly low and make sure that they have a cool side and a warm side of the enclosure. In this enclosure, the light is uh, compact power fluorescent which isn't very strong so it doesn't heat them up a lot. Just enough to increase the temperature a little bit above room temperature. They like it around between maybe 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit ideally. For substrate dry sand is great. The sand I'm using here is simply washed and screened play sand that I bought at a hardware store and an inch or two of that is sufficient. It should remain pretty dry. For decor, some branches and or rocks to climb on are really good. They will utilize every inch of surface area that you provide for them. So a lot of climbing surface is good, but they also need places under which they can hide. They like to kind of dig a temporary uh, little spot or excavation at night where they will sleep. And that's really about it for the enclosure itself. Pretty simple. As far as care goes, the most important consideration there is feeding. There are several things that you can feed your velvet ant, but keep in mind that they are nectar feeders. And so you need to find nectar alternatives. One simple but somewhat expensive option is to get uh, bug jelly that you can buy online. I'll put links to a couple of places that will provide bug jelly. It's very easy and convenient to use, but like I said, it can be a little bit on the expensive side. You can also make your own bug jelly. The card up here links to a video that will show you how to make your own bug jelly. Now, instead of bug jelly, you can also use nectar and you can base it on honey or you can base it on sugar. Very similar to what they'll be eating in the wild. You can take either honey or sugar and dilute it between four and six parts of water. And there are several ways you can offer that. You can put it in a shallow deli cup with some cotton balls. You can also put it in a test tube with a small piece of cotton. Or you can use feeders like these. I use all three and they all work fairly well. The deli cup method and the test tube method are very simple and easy. I like the feeders as well and I'll put a link in the description to these particular feeders. These feeders are designed for ants and the size that I'm using here is a size designed for larger ants. It works really really well but the only caveat is that you can't use honey in these because the honey if left in this container will ferment after a day or two and start to leak. Uh, if you just use the sugar water, these feeders are just about leak proof. And as you can see, my velvet ants really like to use them. And you have another option as well. You can provide juicy fruit to the uh, velvet ants and they will lap up the juice. You can cut a grape in half, for example, or a pear. I've even given them cucumber. Any, any kind of juicy fruit or a sweet vegetable is something that you can try with your velvet ants and they'll probably go after that as well. So that's about it for feeding. It's really pretty easy to do. So let's talk about the advantages of keeping velvet ants as pets. One, 
is because they are so varied. There are so many different species with different patterns and colors and sizes is that you can make a very interesting community of different species of Elvidans. Even though they're solitary in the wild, they can coexist quite peacefully together. They can also live with other species. You can keep them with various species of desert beetles, such as blue death fanning beetles. Velvidants are also extremely active. When you first get them, it might take them a while to get used to the new situation and so on. They might be a little bit shy. But after a while, they start to relax and they're very, very active. The uh, light, if you keep a light on them during the day, they will tend to be active, especially in the afternoon and evening hours. But at any time of the day, and even after the lights go out, you can see them uh, milling around the enclosure. Very, very active. One of the most active invertebrates, actually, that I've ever kept. And except for the fact that they don't fly, I like to think about them as the hummingbirds of the insect world. They're very colorful, they're very active, and they always bring a lot of life and vitality. There are, of course, a few disadvantages to keeping velvidans. One of them is that they are not available captive bred. This is because, being parasites of certain ground nesting bees and wasps and things like that, the situation or environment that you'd need to replicate in order to provide that for them to reproduce is pretty difficult, pretty prohibitive. So it's just not done. And because of that, you know, there's only a certain number that can be sustained um, being collected from the wild. Um, of course, they are pretty abundant, but there are limits to everything, and we need to be mindful of that. Another issue with collecting them from the wild is that you don't know how old they are when you collect them. They only appear to live to a maximum of about two years, and so you might get adults that are near the end of their lifespan. You might get newly metamorphosed velvidans that are going to live, you know, about two years after you get them. You just never know. And so there's a disadvantage there as well. Another important disadvantage to consider when you're thinking of keeping velvidans is that they do have a pretty painful sting. Now, it's not a very dangerous sting, although we have to be mindful that some people could have allergies to them and things like that. But in general, though it's not a very dangerous sting, it is quite painful. So these are not a pet that you would like to handle. It's not really a good idea to handle them, nor is it a good idea to keep them in a situation where unsupervised young children might get to them, anything like that. It's just not a good idea uh, to do anything like that. But if it weren't for the fact that they're not captive bred and for their painful sting, I could recommend them a lot more highly. I think they're, they're beautiful, they're quite fascinating, and even though they're not a pet for everyone, uh, they're one of my favorite insects. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Now, if you like this video and you want to know more about velvet ants or you're thinking about setting up a velvet ant community of your own, please check out the links in the description. And thanks for watching today. I post videos every Wednesday and Friday, all on aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to rate, share, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then click the bell icon so you don't miss my next video. Okay, I wanted to share something pretty cool about velvet ants with you. They are amazingly equipped to defend themselves from predators. First of all, the aposematic coloration warns predators from even trying to bother with them. Uh, second, their velvety hairs um, are distasteful. Predators have a hard time eating or swallowing something that's so hairy. Uh, third, they have an exoskeleton that is extremely tough and resistant to damage. Fourth, they have a very powerful, painful sting, and so anything that does try to eat them is likely not to try again. But they have another defense that's actually pretty interesting, and that is stridulation. And this is a kind of sound that they create by rubbing parts of their body together. And this is what it sounds like. They are parasites of ground nesting. Another pretty big disadvantage is... Another Another pig. Okay, can we go to the next page now?